I'm shooting this with the with the 23 millimeter f2 so it's uh, a bit closer to me and I'm kind of almost feeling like this tally light is might be visible in this video so I'd learn something you can't apparently turn on and off face detection once you start filming so I thought I could you know hold the camera up here and talk about it and then I would just reach over and press I have the function button on the top of the X-T4 setup to turn on and off face detection. And I thought I'd be able to turn it off. To, and I had the, the focus box kind of over in this area of the screen. So right now it's over here on my face. And I can see in the LCD the, eyes on, the eye detection's on this eye and it has the green around my face. And then I thought, you know, if I get out of frame, it would then pick this up but I literally have to hide my face because I have to leave face detection on because there's no way to turn it off if I press the button now nothing happens so that's pretty lame it would be nice to be able to without stopping the recording be able to turn on and off face for this type of situation I know it's kind of a weird edge use you know outlier use case but it would be nice nonetheless curious if this looks a little bit different with uh, having the camera like literally two f like the front of the lens is like a foot and a half maybe from my face it's really close uh it kind of seems strange actually looking into the camera this close to me uh with the 23 versus generally i'm using uh the 35 f2 as i've mentioned and the camera is maybe i don't know four or five feet away from me so anyway what i was going to talk about i guess i'll just kind of keep this near my face here or do this or block in but i want to talk about the the xh1 and kind of my thoughts on having it after uh, I've had it more than three years now, well, three years as of last month. So I got this during the you know fire. Well, I don't know if it was the fire sale because I think it may have gone on serious fire sale right at the end for nine ninety nine, the under you know thousand dollars with everything the the body, the grip, and the three batteries. Uh, it even comes with the the little uh, AC adapter that plugs in to uh, this DC nine volt in so you can power the camera the whole time and charge the two battery grip batteries. Uh, I think it went for 999 at the end, but I got it in January, 2019 when it was 1299, which was like a significant discount from, I feel like it was $2,000 with the battery grip when it first was you know announced, which was at the time seemingly very steep. And, you know, I was kind of thinking of getting something new. Back then I was shooting the X-T1, I guess, was my newest Fuji. So I was looking for something new, you know, in 2019. That's a really old camera. But, you know, I had kind of, I guess, been content. I had gone through different bodies and had sold everything. And I basically was down to the, the, X yeah, the X-T1. That was all I had. Seemed like a good deal at twelve ninety nine. Went for it, and you know I loved it at the time. You know, and I still really like this camera. It's just now that I'm comparing it to the XT four, you know, you can kind of feel that it's a bit, a bit old now. But the grip, so especially with the battery grip, even without it, the grip's really nice because it has this deep. Hopefully, this will kind of be in focus. I guess I could get closer, but you could tell this grip's really good. This grip's even better, obviously, than even the XT four filming me. Has all the typical. You know, I really I always love the, the ISO dial on the X-T1, but it was annoying because you had to, hold, they fixed this in the X-T2, but you had to hold down the lock to turn it. Whereas the X-T2 and the X-T, or X-H1, and then obviously X-T3, 4, everything else, you could unlock it and leave it unlocked. And that's generally how I use it. Sometimes I'll lock it if, you know, kind of taking it and moving it around too much and don't want it to get bumped because it can turn, but it's, it's still stiff enough. So that I really liked. And then obviously I like my shutter uh, speed control. I honestly, I'm not really too, I don't think the exposure comp dial is that big of a deal. I really used to ride the exposure comp shooting aperture priority with the, my original Fujis, like the, the X-Pro1 and the X-100S. I definitely did that a bit. I've kind of gone more to shooting manual a little bit more, or at least shooting generally manual, but sometimes I guess I, I was trying to think, what do I do more often? auto shutter speed or auto uh, ISO. I'm not really sure. I've always, I'm always controlling the aperture manually pretty much. I just kind of like that. But I, even the shutter speed, I kind of like to have it set to a specific thing. I guess the, I guess I do uh, aperture priority with, with manual ISO and, you know, auto shutter speed more often because with the IBIS cameras, it started with this. So I guess where I kind of evolved to that, I don't care if the shutter speed kind of gets really slow because with the IBIS, unless you get crazy slow, it still works. 
Uh, I didn't really care about the loss of that. And I thought the screen was kind of neat, and I still think this the screen's kind of neat. You can even see it. You can make it glow. Here, let me kind of get close up. Uh, dark or glow. It's kind of like a backlight. And it's just, it's nice. And if you're in movie mode, which I, oh, sorry, I am in movie mode right now, it it's going to show, let me turn this back on, the movie stuff. But then if you're in a stills mode, it's going to have, so back to like single, it's going to have, Obviously, the aperture is zero because there's no lens, but it's kind of cool that it kind of works for what your ad tells you. A lot of information. The battery level is really important. Uh, same stuff you can get on the back screen, obviously, but I don't know. I like it. I kind of miss it a bit with this X-T4, so that was kind of cool. Uh, the build, you know, this this was the, well, kind of one of the last... I guess the X100V is still made in Japan, but the X-T4 ended up being made in China. So this was still made in Japan. I don't guess it doesn't actually say it. It must say it on the bottom, but it's, I have the battery grip on it. Uh, I like the screen, which, you know, the X-T1 just had the normal screen that just did this and this, kind of just the, the flip out to do, you know, low angle like that. Or you could do the, it's a little weird with the battery grip. You could do that. What was cool about the, and this was the X-T2 also, but with the X-H1, they let you do this, where you can kind of do a portrait low angle, and that was really cool. Uh, still had the D-pad, which I don't, I don't know, I like it. I, I'm fine with it. I guess I don't have to have it. I didn't, don't miss it too much on the, the X-E3, but it is nice. And then the, you know, just the specs, obviously. I didn't have any of the 24 megapixel uh, new sensors that have the bigger, it's kind of like a bigger box. So it's about, put the camera down. This, I'm looking at this, the LCD to try to gauge, gauge, but the phase area was kind of like a box, maybe here on the frame you're looking at. So it didn't go out to this area or this area on the edges. It had like almost to the top and bottom and then maybe out to here. Whereas the, the X-T1 was just like a rectangular really small portion of phase array so this had the bigger phase array and you know with the three batteries and the grip you know really good grip minor thing but you know this i really love these straps so this is a really nice strap with the neoprene and whatnot and they give you one with the xt4 as well and i think the gfx's come with them uh, this was the first camera to ever debut the strap as far as i know so these are really cool and it just you know was a, a lot of a lot of bang for the buck uh, 8,000 shutter speed. So, you know, a lot of this stuff was on the X-T2, but I didn't have that body. And I just felt like, you know, this is the time to upgrade. And I, I don't regret it at all. The IBIS, you know, I should have mentioned at the beginning, that was a big thing. The, a lot of cool features. So I really liked the camera, was using it, f found stuff that I didn't even think, would, I would think is that cool, but I ended up using it a bit and then kind of not lately, but like the 120 frames per second. When I first got it, I was doing little slow-mo videos, but... I guess I'm not like, you know, Casey with camera conspiracies and filming squirrels and stuff. Maybe I should try that. But it was kind of fun. I guess when like the, I'm trying to, I remember posting a video, not on this channel, but on my personal channel, like with the rain, I was just testing it out. And it's kind of neat filming rain at 120 frames per second and then, you know, playing it back at like 30, 30p. It, it auto converts it in camera, which I like. A lot of cool features, cool camera, but obviously, you know, they kind of got screwed up because... Fuji was like, oh, let's bring out the X-T3 just like six months later or whatever. It wasn't even a year later. I'm convinced. It felt like six months. Or maybe it was six months after I got this. I don't know. It was quite soon after I got this or maybe around the time I got this. The X-T3 may have already been announced with a 26 megapixel sensor and, you know, the newer processor, which my X-T4 has. And, uh, you know, that was kind of it. This thing just kind of disappeared. People stopped uh, wanting it and they cleared them out and then they were gone. And everybody said it was a terrible camera and criticized everything, you know, kind of stupid. But then it kind of became a cult camera. I'm seeing these now selling used, and they're older now. You know, mine I got near the end of the production when they were selling them new. For, you know, you know, buying it from like Amazon or B and H. Uh, maybe it went to twenty, the end of twenty nineteen. Again, I got it January twenty nineteen. That fire sale of a thousand dollars maybe it was middle twenty nineteen. So. You know, it's kind of an older camera, and people are paying. I've seen some sell for over 800 I think I saw one near $900, and that's kind of 
kind of surprising because this camera was not popular initially. But I think people are realizing, you know, it's not the best, but it's not bad. And the IBIS, honestly, I think is totally underrated. People are like, oh, the X-T4 and everything else does such a better job. Maybe. Maybe it's a little bit better, but uh, I'm pretty impressed with it still. If you use a wider lens, so the 16 millimeter 1.4 is great. It, it's really stable. You can even walk around. You can walk up and down stairs with it. You know, if you're careful, and it's pretty damn stable. It looks really good. And uh, 18 to 55 is another one. With that, I think it's because it's dual stable. It works very well. Kind of feel like I should use that more with this, or had used it more. And I, I, I haven't even mounted it on my XT4 yet, but I got to give that a try because that dual stable seems to be the the way to go. But it's a really cool camera. I filmed. Uh, a lot of video and some stills when we went to uh, Florida for a Disney World last year, last summer, uh, summer 20, uh, 2021. Yeah, we're in 22. Uh, we took it to, I'm trying to win other trips. We went out to the coast to, if you know California at all, but it's uh, kind of north north of San Francisco, up the, up the coast a bit, northern California area called Fort Bragg. Uh, kind of just a little coastal town. Took it out there. We went out to another coastal area, even closer to the San Francisco area, called uh, Dillon Beach. It's kind of a tiny little beach community uh, during like uh, November time period. Brought it out there, took some video, and I'll put some clips. I've put some of them in some other videos, but I'll put a few, you know, sample clips throughout this taken with this camera. But it really ignited my, and I think that was part of the reason I got it was video. You know, I wanted to get into filming my family, my kids, with video, you know, doing video clips, and uh, I just had looked at the random videos I'd taken in the past with various, my iPhone, my uh, Sony NEXs years ago. Those actually had okay video, honestly. It was better video than the early Fujis by far. It actually was usable, but the typical Fuji problem was the video back on those 60 megapixel cameras. The contrast was just brutal. It was just like every, all the blacks were crushed. The more was everywhere. It was a mess. It was really rough. So I think this is why it was a big, you know, contributing factor in me getting this. Uh, I guess why I'm talking about it is I'm like now thinking with this X-T4, it's obviously superior to this for video uh, stills even uh, as far as the output. This is better ergos uh, for most of it. I can't see myself when I film with this. So this is kind of nice with the X-T4 I'm filming. I can actually glance over there and see that it's focused correctly and everything's working. All I know with this is that the tally light's flashing, so it, it's pretty useful because if it just, just it randomly will stop recording even before the limits, and at least I'll know. With the XT4, I have to stop. I gotta stop, train myself to stop looking over there, but I have both the tally light and the screen with a little red flashing circle, so that's kind of nice. But uh, I'm kind of like, should I sell this? But I love it, and I, you know, I just feel like I would regret it because it, it's still a really fun camera, and I feel like it's unique. Maybe see what happens with the X-H2 if they ever make it. For now, I don't know. I kind of think I'm going to keep it. In fact, if I'm going to sell a camera, the one I'm, I think about selling is the X-E3. But the part holding me back from that is it's my small camera. So if I don't have a small Fuji, would I be willing to take this? Or I guess really I was trying to tell myself to take the X-T4 because I love it so much and its output. But I don't know, these are bigger cameras. I take the grip off this a lot. Like when I took it to Florida, took off the grip, uh, especially for like keeping in the bag and the plane and stuff. I don't want to have this grip. It makes this camera monstrous. But that also makes, look how good the grip is. This is super comfortable. So, yeah, kind of on the fence about it. I love this. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's not perfect, you know. There's some little annoyances. This this uh, little control is easily bumped. So if I had it on a video, I'm trying to make sure it doesn't focus on my face, it, I'll hit it on something and then it's in this uh, bracket mode. So this this was a bad design. They should have... Whoops. I'm trying to hide my face so it doesn't focus on my face. This... This shouldn't be so easy to move. And I don't know why it goes from video to bracket. Like, you have to go through all the continue. This has continuous medium. That was another one that's kind of weird. Continuous high and, and low. CH, CM, CL. 
but the CM, if I remember correctly, when you're in the menu, it's a uh, only electronic shutter. I don't know what they were, what that was about. That the medium continuous mode they would expect you to do electronic shutter only, whereas the continuous high and continuous low you can choose with the you know the setting in the camera if it's gonna be electronic or me or mechanical shutter. So some strange stuff like that. I definitely like what they did with the XT4 where there's just the dedicated uh, movie control. So the movie stills control that you guys have all seen here on the XT4. I don't really miss the photometry that this has because I generally just use the multi. And it's very rare that I switch it sometimes to the center weighted or the whatever the full width one is. Average or something. I never really use spot to be honest. That's something I rarely use, so I just have it. I don't even have it on the Q menu in this XT4. I just have it in the menu because it's, it's like something I rarely change, so I don't miss that at all. And then this control, whatever sub command dial thing on the T4, I don't change it, I guess, much because it's it's only when I'm going, I guess, from stills to HDR, I've been playing with that, or stills to uh, like a high speed. Yeah, it's kind of where I'm at. Like. Logically, I should sell this because it's redundant to the the T4 and inferior in a lot of ways, but I still kind of love it. I kind of feel like Ken Wheeler, how he was saying he would never sell his his XH1, but I I wonder if he is because he's like selling all of his camera gear now, becoming like a prepper guy. But I don't I don't know if I can sell this. I really like this body, and I think it's just a cool camera. And honestly, for stills. Like this style screen is a hundred times better. I, I don't really like the this is weird. Okay, so the one thing I like about the X-T4's flip screen other than if I'm recording myself, which the weird thing is I've been recording a lot of my videos still on the X-H1, even though I have the T4. Uh, I guess because I just leave the tripod mount on this camera. That's probably a convenience factor. But I like with the flip screen, you can protect the screen. So that, that's actually a bonus. I was always worried, especially on trips, like when we were at Disney World and I'm, you know, running around with the kids and the family. Like, I'm always a little bit nervous. This is supposed to be like a hard Lex or some kind of hard, I don't know if it's Corning or, or Gorilla Glass. It's supposed to be some scratch-proof glass, if I recall correctly. I think they said the same thing with the X-T1 and 2. Uh, I got one tiny little scratch on it in Florida which you, I'm looking at the reflection. I can only see it if you have the light, you know, the exact angle, so it's super tiny. I was always kind of worried about it, whereas I like that on the T4. You know, I generally just have the screen folded closed like a fake X-Pro3, but it's nice that I can have it on the strap dangling against my chest. It could bump a zipper or a button on my jacket or whatever, and I don't even care because it's, it's closed. I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about scratching the plastic part. I'd be worried about scratching the, the glass of the LCD, so to speak. So that's, that's kind of a bonus. But <clears throat> as far as the flip, other than these, you know, these times I'm filming myself and want to be able to actually see what's going on, the, the screen isn't super useful. So for stills, it's, it's kind of annoying, actually, when you're, like, holding the X-T4, you know, like this. And you gotta fold out the screen, have it out here to have any kind of an angle. Because if you fold it in, you gotta have it flat, which is kind of lame. It defeats the whole purpose. I love just with these, you just go like this, and I'm always shooting down like that, and it's super easy. Or like again, what was really cool with this was the the portrait, where you know you're taking a portrait, especially with a battery grip, and then you just pop this out like that. Like that's super cool. And you can kind of do that with the T4 by you just slipping it down, but the landscape style it's just like lame to have to have this the screen over here not even in video it's kind of like i don't know i don't like the flip screen to be honest i don't mind it and it's been useful for you know the talking head video stuff I'm not convinced I'm not really convinced of it i'm not sure i'm kind of curious what fuji might do with the xh2 because it's supposed to be like really professional. I don't know if you're supposed to have a flip screen like this, but then like the YouTube community and all the, you know, YouTube uh, videographers claim you have to have the flip screen, but I don't know. I kind of kind of think it's crap. I think it's a weird body, but the fat one that the S1H Panasonic has maybe is the best setup, but I don't know. They want to make the X-H2 that fat, but how that was a 
this style normal tilt screen, but then it also flips around because it's like a double mount. You know, Fuji did that actually on the, what do they call it? The X200, I think. The X200 had that. So maybe they could beef that up and do it themselves. It doesn't do the portrait fold out, I think. It just did the normal tilt down and tilt up for, you know, above or below, but then it would fold around. The Fuji one looked a little bit more fragile than the, the Lumix one. I guess, you know, something else that's kind of funny is I've mentioned it already. It's really easy to just start staring at the screen over there like I like this instead of like this. And I think it's distracting when you watch that video. I posted a video. I think it was the the one about my Tudor watch that I'm still pissed off about. And after I recorded that whole video, which was kind of like an emotional like rant video, I realized I was staring at the LCD the whole time. And I, I didn't want to refilm it because then it was like... It was like a, an honest, like getting my feelings out about my frustration buying, you know, that purchase. And I didn't want to refilm it because it would almost be fake. So I just went with it and had to upload it anyway. It's, <clears throat> it's really easy to just start looking. And I am sure throughout this video, I know I've, I'm trying to obviously just kind of once in a while like that, a little quick check, but it's really easy to get caught staring at it. When I'm using this guy, there's no, there's no screen. So I don't have any problems. I'm either looking at the lens or kind of thinking and, you know, looking off into space. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Tell me your thoughts, you know. Would it be, and I know some people are going to be like, yeah, you need to sell it because it's redundant. But do you think I'm crazy to keep this guy? Here, let me get it closer to let you guys see it. Hopefully it's, uh, you know, it looks like I hope it's focused here. It's a cool camera, beefy design. I would, I will, I will say... I feel like the X-T4 feels possibly better built. This has like a two-piece bottom plate. You can see a little seam here. The, the way they did the T4, I don't know if the T, maybe the T3 was the same way. There's no seam in the bottom, whereas this and the X-H1 and the X-Pro1, they all kind of have like, it's like a front piece and a back piece and they've screwed them together and there's some screws in the bottom and you can see it. Whereas they must have done the two pieces on the T4 Maybe in the middle section and the bottom plate must be clipped in there. I'm not sure how they do it. But it's kind of nice that there's... Actually, maybe there is a screw, actually. Yeah, I think there's a screw in one of the holes for the for the battery grip pins that kind of, you know, hold the... There's one here and one over here that keep the battery grip uh, solid. I think was, I saw a screw inside of one of those holes on the T4. But the they definitely have the build down, you know despite this being, you know, made in Japan and really nice. And it is a really well-built camera. It definitely still feels substantial and it has supposedly that thicker multi-coated paint thing. I remember that was a thing they talked about. It had like extra layers of paint. The T4, I think it just has kind of normal paint, <clears throat> but the, the build seems pretty good. All right, I think I'm rambling. I'm down to two minutes and that's something kind of cool seeing the time i'm down to two minutes and four seconds so i don't know what that means that 15 minute video almost kind of gone a little long i'll trim it but let me know let me know your guys thoughts silly to keep it reasonable to keep it I've already had it three years am i gonna still use it probably is it should i just cut cut it loose let me know talk to you guys next time